What's up, guys? Happy Monday night. Welcome to the Battle and Buck Show. I'm Mason Zapeski, your host. Today's episode is going to be actually a little shorter. We're just going to briefly recap the Pirates week. It was it was awful, their worst week of the season, to be honest, because they put up a goose egg when it comes to the number of wins. So we'll recap that first. Then we'll just get to standings, standings and then we'll look ahead to the week ahead with matchups against the Padres and Mariners. So... First things first, the reason this episode's shorter and there's no playoff probabilities tonight is because I've been pretty busy. We just got back from our yearly trip. Those videos should be out soon. I think there's like five, maybe even six of them. Here, let me check if I could see. Sinking pause. I'm going to try counting. One. There are six videos, six new videos coming out, including this one about our trip. So I've just been pretty busy with that. So sorry about the lack of probabilities and that. So yeah, sorry about that. So we'll just, like I said, quickly recap the Pirates week. As I said, it wasn't good. Look at the standings, preview the week ahead. Try to get this one done in 20. All right, let's look at the past week now, Sail we? Tuesday night, August the 6th, the Pirates, after a rain-delayed three-hour game, three-hour rain delay, the Padres defeated the Pirates 6-0. Originally, Dylan Cease was set to go up against Bailey Falter. However, the rain said heck no to that. And in the game instead was Brian Hoeing against John Woodford. Woodford pretty much set up the Pirates to collapse in the fifth, allowing Four runs in the inning, setting the Pirates up for a certain loss, and indeed that's what happened. Padres went on to defeat the Pirates six nothing. Not a lot of positives there for the sec for the second consecutive year though. The game, the Pirate game before the day before our trip, resulted in a long grain delay. Unfortunately, it was a different outcome. Last year, before we headed out to San Francisco, the Pirates beat the Braves 7-6 in a game where Osvaldo Beto, who actually pitches for the Athletics now, as you probably know, I'm a big fan of his, pitches for the A's, out Spencer Strider, and that's part of why I was advocating for him to come back to Pittsburgh at the deadline. He put up an amazing start Saturday against Toronto for Oakland, and he does well against quality teams. He pitched a pretty solid outing against the Dodgers last Sunday. And he pitched as quality reliever as a quality reliever against the Phillies, so definitely crucial. That's for sure. So wish we would have him back, but we won that game seven six over the Braves. If you remember that game, for it was a long, it was a year ago, so I doubt you do. But anyway, this outcome was unfortunately a different one, and the Pirates lost six nothing. Wednesday night, while I was on my flight, it was unfortunate, but. The Pirates lost to the Padres 9-8. Going into the ninth inning, the Pirates held a 6-5 lead. This game was crazy. This was actually nationally televised on FS1. It was going back and forth. Pirates took a 2-0 lead early. Then Jackson Merrill Helmer 2-1. Then Reynolds got a hit, scoring Triolo 3-1. By the way, this is Car ESPN. Then Padres hit a home run, hit Joe. Haiga Soika, something like that. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name there. Hit a home free run blast to put the Padres up for free. Then McCutson homered, tying it up. Merrill singled, it's 5 4 Padres. McCutson scored two on a single, 6 5 Pirates. And then in the top of the ninth, David Bednar comes in, allows a home run. Padres tied at 6. 10th inning, we put Colin Holderman in. Padres score free runs, take a 9 6 lead. Pirates tack on two in the bottom of the ninth. Doesn't work out. And the Padres win. This is the first of many games I blame on Derek Selton. Number one, I mean, you can't blame Bednar so much for this one because it was the first one and he was pretty efficient recently. However, Colin Holderman has sucked as of late. Putting him in, in a clutch situation where you're still 500 and you still have hope is not a solution. We needed to improve our bullpen. Why can't we use Jalen Beeks? Why why wasn't Jalen Beeks available? I like the way he pitches. I like the way he plays. Why didn't Jalen Beeks come in this game? 
did not pitch Tuesday night. Let's look who pitched Tuesday night. Woodford, Nichol, Nicholas, Stratton, and Stantana. Where's Joe and Beeks? Oh, he was all... Oh, I'm sorry. He was already in an inning. I'm just reading... This is, oh, This makes me more angry. Joe Beeks was in for an inning. He did a loud earned run. Why don't we keep him in in the eighth inning and put Chapman in for the ninth? Chapman this year has been more efficient than Bednar, although Chapman has struggled, but he's been more efficient than Bednar. Bednar has had his fair share of injuries this year. Why can't we just let Joe and Beeks pitch more? I mean, you don't just go out and get a guy for one inning. Come on now. And why are, I mean, we're already in, I'm not counting 2020 because that was COVID and they just did that for the heck of it, just to get people happy again, get sports back on because COVID was a depressing time. We all know COVID was a depressing time. Alrighty, enough with that. Um, point is, I'm not counting COVID as part of the rebuild because it was just a screw, screw off year. Doesn't matter. We got Henry Davis with the number one pick. And that's the other thing. We got Henry Davis during a year. Okay, so we're going to play 60 games. It's good for the Pirates because we're supposed to suck. It's only 60 games. It's a short year. You get the number one pick, and you draft somebody who has flopped. But if you put him on any of the other 29 teams, he would most likely succeed, even the 28 and 90 Chicago White Sox. Pretty darn pathetic, if you ask me. And he doesn't even have a role in the organization. Come on now. That was the biggest flop ever. But anyway, 2019 hurdle was fire. After 2019. 2020 was the screw off year because of COVID. 2021, you're 62 and 100. Year one. 2022, 62 and 100. Year two. 2023, 76 and 86. Year three. In year four of a rebuild, you should not have guys like just Monty Grandol. G1 Bay, Jared Triolo in your lineup consistently. Let's look at Baltimore. 2018, year one. I'm just getting counted because they sucked. I mean, this year is year one for the White Sox, technically. 2019, 2020, 2021. So 2022, because again, we're not counting COVID. 2022 was year four of the Orioles rebuild. They were 83 and 79, who I thought we could closely resemble, but that might be a pipe dream because of how we played this week. Here's their catcher. Well, their starting lineup, or their players. Adley Rutschman, Gunnar Henderson, Trey Mancini, Jorge Mateo, Ryan Mountcastle, Chris Owings, Yusniel Diaz, Austin Hayes, Cedric Mullins, Anthony Santander. I mean, it's not the most quality lineup, but it's surely as heck better than the lineup we're rolling out. That's pretty darn sad. And we're not going to be that great probably next year. We might be good enough to get the sixth seed in the NL next year. If we're lucky. Ridiculous. Another one bites the dust. That's how I look at this. Padres win. Thursday sucked even more. Padres take a 4 nothing lead after two innings. Sucks. But in the sixth, we respond. We decide to turn the green light on. The light's red. And it flips the green. And zoom we go. Scoring three runs in the bottom of the sixth. Taking a... Or only trial on the Padres now 4-3. to three. Bottom of the seventh. Joey Barr comes up. Does Joey Barr things. Hits a home run. Probably the best acquisition Sherrington has made ex without draft, except for drafting schemes or outside of drafting schemes. This kid, I knew he was going to be good. The Giants completely blew it with him. Just like if we trade Davis, he is most like, more likely than not going to succeed on his new team. Because it's just a situation, it would happen where the other 29 teams, it would succeed, it just happens you were the one it All right, so Joey Barr hits a home run. We laid 5-4. Top of the knife, we put David Bednar in again after he blows a save last night. What does he do the next day, less than 24 hours later? You guessed it, blown a save. 
And I'm not trying to diss on Bednar at all. Look, I love David Bednar. Our dads actually worked together way back when. So I have a lot of respect for Bednar. He's my favorite player on the team and my favorite player in the league. However, again, he... I mean, somewhat's on him, but not really. He's clearly not right this year. Going back to April in that game against Detroit, where the whole crowd blowed him. And don't say I'm defending him here, because look, I mean, he he deserves criticism when he does, doesn't do his job. And the, these past series, he didn't do his job. So, I mean, he didn't do his job. I will say that. He failed at doing his job. However, back in April, we all knew David Benner was not right when he blew that lead against Detroit and he allowed a walk-off home run against San Francisco. This has not been his best year, and we know it hasn't been his best year. So think about that. Something is clearly not right with him. I think that injury has held him back, and he's still a little banged up. So it's... Dumb as crap for Selton to put him in the night after he blows a save. And what does he do less than 24 hours later? You guessed it, blows another save. Padres lead 7-5. Hago Soka, again, how, I don't know how to pronounce it, I'm sorry. Drowned it into a fierce folder's choice. Bogart's, Bogart scored on an air, and Merrill scored on a throw here by shortstop O'Neill Cruz. Kim is out a second. So that's on Ben North. That's on the airs. You can't be doing this air crap. And then a res doubles to right. Heike Soka scores. Maybe that one's not on Ben North. You gotta feel better. You gotta be more disciplined. What's the Pirates are not right now. And then to less singles gives us false hope because we lose the game 7 6 and get swept by the Padres before headed out to California. Real nice. Wednesday night was on Ben North. For sure. First day night, some was, some wasn't. The fielding air sucked. And that was part of the problem, for sure. Anyway, real quick, on to Friday night's game. Mitch Keller wasn't himself. Padres scored nine runs, including five in the third inning, taking a massive lead. It was 7-1 to one at the time. Looks like Keller came out. Padres, or Dodgers win the game 9-5. Freeman homered, Otani homered, Smith singled, Rojas singled, then Cruz homered, Oscar Hernandez homered, Oscar Hernandez homered, and later Joey Bart homered, Enrique Hernandez homered, and Cruz singled. 9-5 Dodgers win. You can't be too mad about this one. The team's struggling. They're playing an elite squad, so yeah, I'm not mad about this one a whole lot. Saturday, same ordeal. I, I can't be mad about this one. Dodgers are just the better team. They're elite. What they're doing is unbelievable. Just maybe they can win a playoff series this year for once. I haven't won one in two years. They won 4-1. to one. Paul Skeens took a loss to the Dodgers. It was his second career major league loss. Four runs allowed to them. Lux doubled. Lux singled. Teoscar homered. And then Cabrian Hayes homered. Gavin Lux, Teoscar Hernandez. They are pretty darn good baseball players. <coughs> if they can handle Paul Skeens and destroy him the way they did, that, that's what they are. Pretty darn good baseball players. So credit to Los Angeles, for sure. Definitely a good game by them. It's a good team. Same with Ryder Ryan. He's pretty darn good. It's the same we can't identify guys like that. And yesterday, was it, it was another one that sucked. We were down 2 nothing early. Or 4 nothing early. Fought back in the third, making it four to two after a home run by Cuts. Later he home two run homer by Cuts. Later he homered again, tying the game in the eighth, making it four to four. No runs were scored in the ninth. The game went to extras. Reynolds singled, scoring Michael A. Taylor, taking a five four lead. Bendor comes in again. Guess what happens? Blues his first save of the week. Rike Hernandez doubles to right, scoring Rojas. We're tied. Tay Oscar singles to right, scoring Hernandez, and that ends the game. I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't watch any highlights these past two games. 
because of my trip, obviously, but that sucked. I mean, it, this series sucked. This week has sucked. I don't know what to do moving forward. Part of it, I think, Sultan is incompetent. I, I, I hate to say this because the guy's very likable. It's just he's an incompetent manager. There's no other way to work right now. That's a shame. And everybody said bye, 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 bye about the trade deadline. We bought and we're worse. What does that tell you? Let's look at the Yankees. Let's look at their record since they acquired Jazz Chisholm, who I love. Actually, bought one of his Marlins clearance certs. I love him so much. <laughs> certs on clearance. Since Chisholm became a Yankee. Let's see the lineup this night. Wasn't in the lineup the night he got traded, so I'm not going to count that. The Yankees are 1 0, 2 0, 3 0, 4 0. 4 and 1, 5 and 1, 6 and 1, 7 and 1, 7 and 2, 7 and 3. They lost the series to the Angels. How about that? That's funny. 7 and 3. 8 and 3. 8 and 4. They're 9 and 4 since they acquired Jazz Chisholm. 9 and 4. Wow. So most teams get better with their acquisitions. We got worse having only won one game since the trade deadline. Well, technically two because the Houston game on the 30th, but. We acquired our guys on the last day, so and they weren't even ready to play because it was like two hours before the game we got them. So I ain't even going to count that one. We've won one game with IKF and De La Cruz. They've gotten worse in their time here. I mean, it's good to see the aggressiveness from Charrington, but I think he, is so, he can be very stubborn at times. Very stubborn. He's probably one of the most, if not the most stubborn, general manager in this league. And that's a problem. So it's a shame, but I think he needs to learn when it comes to the, the trade day. I mean, I would have done a deal. Let's look at our prospects. Think about it. our top like two prospects are pitchers. We have pitching. Skeens, Jones, Keller. Hopefully Oviedo works out, comes back here and storm at it. And then you have Bailey Falter. All right. You want we should have what I would have done. Jazz Chisholm is very easy to acquire. You just call Peter Bendix, you offer G1 Bay, Henry Davis, Braxton Ashcraft, and Mitch Jeb. That's all it takes to get a guy like Chisholm. Yankees didn't even pay that. We could have easily, and I mean easily, got Jazz Chisholm. Same we didn't get Jazz. Very upset. Very upset. Alright, let's move on past the Pirates, and let's look at the standings now, shall we? American League, let's start with the AL East. The Baltimore Orioles and the New York Yankees are tied 70-49. and 49. Red Sox are 61-55, and 55, 7.5 back. Rays 59 and 58, 10 back. Blue Jays 54 and 64, 15 and a half back. In the AL Central, we got the Cleveland Guardians 69 and 49. Minnesota Twins are 65 and 52. Kansas City Royals, or three and a half back. Twins are three and a half back, I'm sorry. Kansas City Royals 65 and 53, four back. Detroit Tigers 6, 56 and 63, 13 and a half back. White Sox 28 and 91, 41 and a half back. They did make the decision to fire Pedro Griefel, their manager, on Thursday. This was the right move because he was an awful manager. Greedy Sizemore is going to be their manager. I remember him with the Phillies, I think. That, that's kind of funny that I remember. He's one of the, When I first started getting into baseball, he was one of the key players on the Phillies, and that's when the Phillies weren't very good either. He's the manager of the White Sox. Yeah, 2014, 2050. That's how I remember him. He was definitely a Philly. That's where I remember him the most. 2014, 15 was a Philly. That's why it was 10 and 11. Wow. Interesting. All right. But when you look at it, back to the alleys, just a little, couple quick words. Orioles and Yankees, that's what it's going to come down to. That's going to be one of the better division races, and it's going to be awesome seeing these two battle at the end for the crown. 
As for this year, Orioles have a series coming up against the Dodgers in two weeks. That should be fun. But they have a series against the White Sox, so that's helpful for their case. They have the Rockies and White Sox back-to-back. -back. That's a chance, like, they can really stack a ton of wins and really get out. Like, their series with the White Sox end September 4th. They should have a four ga free game, four game lead at that point. If they don't, then I think the Yankees probably win this division. They have one more series left at the Yankees, and it's the last week of the year, Tuesday the 24th of September through Thursday the 26th. Baltimore leads the season series. Yankees would have to sweep that series to get the tiebreaker. So I think this division, honestly, favors Baltimore right now. I just do. However, the Yankees do play the White Sox this week. Then they go to Detroit, but that'll be tough. Then they got the Guardians, the Rockies, at the Nationals. I mean, these schedules, when you look at it and put it in perspective, these schedules are pretty even. However, right now, I would technically have a slight edge to Baltimore, just because. Central, Cleveland's probably going to win that division, but it's important to note that Minnesota and Kansas City are rapidly closing the gap. I'm so mad right now with, in terms of the Royals, not because they're winning, but because the Pirates can't be like the Royals. Royals were much worse, 15 games worse than the Pirates last year, and the Royals now control playoff spot because they spent a little more money than us in free agency. We need to learn how to spend. We need to learn not to just take the cheap, take the cheap deal and walk away, actually do something. This team is capable of winning game, uh, games, and it's capable of winning now. Do something, Charrington. Do something, Nutty. But Rawls are in. Tigers and White Sox, yeah, they're kind of relevant. ALS time now. Astros and Mariners are tied for the division lead there. Rangers are 7.5 back. Angels are 10.5 back. A's are 13 back. I don't think Texas really has much of a chance at the division at this point. I mean, their chances are winding down. Seven and a half, it's not impossible, but it's going to be pretty darn tough. Angels and A's, yeah. Enjoy, enjoy the offseason. <laughs> right, comes. NL time. NL East. Phillies still lead that division. 69-49, 20 games over. Braves, seven and a half back. They're actually having issues making the playoffs. Will they get in? We'll talk about that. Mets, 61-57, and 57, eight games back. It's very close in that division in terms of the second-place battle, and that will likely be the final NL wildcard. Nationals, you're 54-65, and 65, not bad but not good, considering where you're at in the rebuild. Marlins are 44-75. and 75. If you're Miami or, San, or Colorado, I think your goal for this year personally, should, it's going to be tough, but I think the goal should be personally just trying to avoid 100 losses. If you could do that, you'll be okay. All right, Central Division now. Milwaukee, you're 67 and 50. You're going the division. St. Louis, seven and a half back, 60 and 58. Chicago on a run, 59 and 69 back. Reds, 51 and 6, 57 and 61, 10 and a half back. Pirates, unfortunately, are in last place again, 56 and 61, 11 back. When you put in perspective compared to last year. The record is not bad at all. Because we were like 10, 11 games under last year at this point. However, it's not where we need to be. And I think they need to come to that conclusion. I mean, if we were 58 and 59, I would be happier. Or even 59 and 58. That's a big difference. So yeah. 56 and 61, not good at all. But still better than last year, which is, I guess, okay. We only need to win 21 more games to officially pass our record from last year. Here, let's do the math. Let's do the math going into this. All right. 56 and 61. We're going to do some math. Filming on my phone, so I don't have access to much to calculator, but it's not calculus. It's pretty easy math. Do we only have 61 plus 56? Let's do that. Oh my god, we only have 45 games left. 
That makes sense, though. Hang on. One. Two. Three. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We only have 45 games. So to surpass our record from last year, which would be winning 77 games, we have to do 45 minus 21. Yeah. Or no. Yeah, 21. 45 minus 21. Four, two. Gotta go 21 and 24. That's very doable, I think. So we should be able to do that. I think so. So that's good. I want to get to 80 wins, which would be going 24 and 21. That's going to be tough, though. It's going to be really tough. All right, now on to the NL West. Dodgers, you're 69-49, leading that division. However, it's not comfortable as the Diamondbacks are right there, 66-53, and 53, three and a half back. Padres, 66-53, and 53, three and a half back. Giants, 61-59, and 59, nine games back. Rockies, 44-75, 25 and a half back. All righty, now on to the wild card races. Currently, your wild card matchups would be six seeded Royal in the American League. You'd get the number one Orioles, who would have a bye. The number two Guardians, who would have a bye. Your number six seed would be the Royals. They would play the Houston Astros, the free seed. So to said that vice versa. I'm sorry. Your fourth seed would be the Yankees. They would play the Twins. If that were your matchups, I would predict the Yankees and the Astros. Astros against Guardians, I'm picking Guardians. Yankees against Orioles, I'm picking Yankees. Yankees against Guardians, I'm picking Guardians right now. Kansas, Seattle, you're two and a half games back. Boston, you're three games back. Tampa Bay, you're five and a half back. Detroit, nine and a half back. Texas, 10 games back. Toronto, 11 back. LA Angels, 13 back. Oakland, 15 and a half back. Chicago, 37 and a half back. Detroit is now under your 10 games. However, it's... I'm not going to change anything. I think Detroit's out, personally. Detroit, Toronto, LA, Oakland, Chicago are the teams I pretty much think have no shot. Texas, yeah. Next week, I think we're going to probably have to put them in the have no shot category, but you never know if a team like that. Never know. It's going to be tough, but very doable. I doubt it, though. So, really, I personally think it's going to even be tough for like Seattle and Boston. So, I think the Royals are in great shape. Not saying it can't, but a fair amount would have to go wrong for them to miss the playoffs. National League, your number one seed as of today. I still think it's Philadelphia. It is. Philadelphia would be your one seed. The Dodgers would be your two. Your free seed would be the Milwaukee Brewers. They would host the six seed Atlanta Braves. Your four seed would be the Arizona Diamondbacks. They would host the fifth seed San Diego Padres. A half game back is the New York or the New York Mets. One and a half games back are the St. Louis Cardinals. One and a half back are the Red Hot San Francisco Giants. Three games back are the Red Hot Cubs. Four and a half back are the Reds. Five back are the Pirates. Eight back are the Nationals. Marlins are 18 back. Rockies are 18 back. Marlins and Rockies are clearly done. Nationals are getting into the danger zone. Them and the Rangers both are pretty much probably going to be eliminated next week. So, yeah, definitely for sure. I'll have to keep a note of the criteria here. It's subject to change every week because of my memory. I can't remember this stuff. But next week, I think we're going down to eight games back. The week weekend of Labor Day, September 1st, I think we're going to six back. September 15th, I think we're going down to five back. And then if you're not within three games on September 22nd, I think you're done. And then September 29th is the end. So, yeah, that's how we're going to do it here moving forward. So, yeah. Anyway, I, I'll do my NL predictions now for you guys. Atlanta and Milwaukee, I think Atlanta easily wins that series. Padres, Diamondbacks, Arizona, same thing. I think they easily win. Diamondbacks, Phillies, I'm going Diamondbacks all day. They own the Phillies. They have the Phillies number. So I can't I can't see not picking the Diamondbacks against Philly. Arizona won the current series three to one, and they won the season series four to three. Arizona just has Philadelphia's number. I don't know how they just do, so I'm picking Arizona all day, every day. Braves, Dodgers, yeah, I'm picking the Braves. I know they're the underdogs, but I'm picking the Braves. 
Braves Diamondbacks, I'm picking Braves. Braves Guardians in the series. This would be an awesome series to watch. I'd love this series if it happens. I'm picking the Guardians. So right now, that's who I think is going to win the World Series. And I wouldn't mind Cleveland winning. That would be very good, I think, if the Guardians won it. So Cleveland's my current World Series prediction. Cleveland over Atlanta. However, that is very subject to change depending on how the bracket's set up and everything. So that's what I have to say there. All right, we're well over schedule. I'm just going to recap. I'm just going to preview the Pirates week ahead. Then we'll talk about... Actually, we'll talk about nothing then, but just going to preview the Pirates week ahead. So, yeah. Tonight, in about an hour and a half, Pirates head to San Diego to play the Padres. Woodford's pitching for us tonight against Joe Musgrove. Woodford should not be the starter. That's insane that he is. It's pathetic. But P Woodford against Musgrove tonight. Tomorrow night, August 14th, Ortiz will pitch for the Pirates against Padres' Michael King. That is a 940 start on MLB Network. August 14th, Pirates again finish off the series in San Diego against the Padres. Mitch Keller will be on the mound for us against former Pirate Martin Perez. That is Wednesday afternoon at 410. Friday night, the Mariners come to town. It's a one-series homestand before we get to Texas, before we got a little homestand with the Reds and the Cubs. On Friday night, game is exclusively on Apple TV, which is not good, but I like it. Logan Gilbert will pitch for Seattle. Skeens will be on the mound for Pittsburgh, so that's good. Saturday afternoon, I'll be at this game. It'll actually be a doubleheader. For us, we're going to the Pirate game and the Steeler game, my dad and I. So I'll have both games, hopefully, on film for you. That'll be a new vlog coming out later this week, or next week. Castillo will be on the mound for Seattle against Bailey Falter. That's on MLB Network as well. Sunday, 135, George Kirby is on the mound for Seattle against somebody undecided for us. I imagine, though, that will be Woodford, unfortunately. After this, though, we go to Texas. Then we come home for the Reds and Cubs. I think this is when we're going to bounce back. I think we're going to most likely get swept by the Padres. But win one game against Seattle. So in that case, here, I tore up that post-it note by accident. What an idiot I am. <laughs> so let's look at it. Let's do the math again. We're going to do some more math before we leave. Sorry I'm well over time. Just want to do this math. Okay, we're 56 and 61. I think we're only going to win one game this week. And I, it's going to be Friday night. That puts you at 57 and 66. I think, though, this stretch here, we got 1, 2, 3 against Texas, 4 against the Reds, 3 against the Cubs. Those 10 games, I think we're going to go 7 and 3. I do. That puts you at 64 and 69. That's not bad. That's going into Cleveland. You lose a series there. You take one game in, in, in Cleveland. You're now 65 and 71. Cubs say you only won one game. 66 and 73. Nationals, I think we'll take three from them. That puts you at 69 and 74. Not bad. Marlins, I think we'll take two out of three from them. That puts you at 71, 75. Not bad in September. Rawls, I think we'll only take one here. That puts you at 72 and 77. Cardinals, I think we'll do horrible this series. 73 and 80. We're almost there. Reds, I actually think we'll take two. I think we'll stun the Reds and take two. That puts you at 75 and 81. Brewers will lose two. We'll win the home finale, or one of those. That puts you at 76 and 83. Yankees, I think we'll take one. 77 and 85. I think it's, it's going to be a climb to get to 77, but I definitely think it's doable, and I think ultimately we will, we will barely get there. So... That's all I have to say, guys. So thanks for tuning in. Greatly appreciate you. Have a good one. Take care. Stay safe. And as always, peace. See you again next Sunday.